Welcome to the Fairfield Planning Commission for November 8th, 2017. May we please have the roll call? Yes, Commissioner Wesley, Commissioner Cohn, Here. Commissioner Branch, Here. Commissioner Pattis, Commissioner Walker, Here. Commissioner McDonald, yes. and uh, Commissioner Geiger. Here. Commissioner Cohn, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? There are speaker cards in the lobby area that must be filled up by anyone who would like to speak on an item under public comments or scheduled matters. Speakers may address items on the agenda at the time the item is considered. Speakers will each be given three minutes to speak. Please pass the card up to us prior to the time for public comments on the item. Next is approval of the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda? No. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Moved and seconded, and all in favor say yes. yes. Opposed? Motion passes. Next is approval of the minutes from the September 13th meeting. Are there any changes to the minutes? Uh, Mr. Chairman, there is a change, and there is a sheet that was handed out to you at your, uh, at your seat there. Uh, for the vote on the 1500 Oliver project, the vote was uh, recorded incorrectly. Uh, Staff heard the vote, secretary heard the vote. It was just typed up incorrectly in the minutes. The final vote on that was officially four to one. Your minutes as uh, published said five to zero. So that uh, document in front of you is a correction to that that accurately reflects the four to one vote. And so uh, staff would recommend that you, as you take a vote on the minutes that it uh, include the, the correction uh, on that sheet there. On that sheet though, there, I was here and it shows that I wasn't. For the for the final vote on this this was you, this was this is the findings the findings the, the week hearing after the hearing vote on the res the official vote on the resolution yeah. Okay. yeah all right do I have a motion to approve the minutes with so, the amendment so moved second I have a motion and second and all in favor and one abstention two abstentions uh, move it passes. Public comments. This is the time for the public to speak on items not on the agenda but within the jurisdiction of the Planning Commission. Items from the public that are not part of the agenda will be taken under consideration without discussion or action by the Commission, uh, but may re be referred to staff. I'll now open the public comment period. I don't have any speaker cards for public comment. See no other cards. I'll now close the public comment period. Next item on the agenda is scheduled matters. For each agendized item, there will first be a presentation by city staff. I'll then ask the applicant, if there is one, to address the Planning Commission. Then I'll open the public hearing, if there is a public hearing, and, and call out the names of people who have filled out speaker cards and ask them to come up and speak. A red light will flash to indicate that your three-minute speaking time is up. I'll then close the public hearing, and after all of our questions have been answered, then after the public hearing is closed, the Planning Commission will deliberate on the item and may have additional questions of staff. We can't take additional testimony or questions from the audience after the public hearing is closed. We'll then vote on the item. So the first item is item A, a presentation on the Linear Park Corridor Study and um, plan for Allen Witt Park renovation. Our staff person is Ann Matola. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Ann Matola. I am the Director of Parks and Recreation for the City of Fairfield. And this evening, I'm really eager to present to you plans for two park projects that are part of the Community Spaces Initiative. This initiative is one of the City Council's work plan goals, and it's a rather lofty and large council goal. It's a multi-year project that prioritizes, prioritizes dedicating city resources on three different parks, Lee Bell, Allen Witt Park, and the Linear Park Trail. The goal of this initiative is to activate park spaces in a way that creates family-friendly environments. I need to ask you a question. Yes. You just added Lee Bell Park. Yes, it, uh, we're not presenting that tonight. Okay, it's, just the, it's just to talk about where these projects came from. Okay. 
So the goals of the Community Spaces Initiative are to create family-friendly environments, maximize use of the parks by the community, and by activating the spaces and making them places where the community gathers, the initiative really strives to improve safety and reduce blight and crime in these areas. So at the end of last year, the city selected two design firms to assist with two of these projects that we're presenting to you tonight. So we have Calendar Associates with us who worked on us with Alan Witt, and we have Pintuan Partners who worked with us on the Linear Park Trail. Um, there's also an in-house project team, and it's led by Parks and Recreation and Public Works, specifically the park planning manager, Fred Biner. Both plans have also been assigned project development teams that include staff from every department. So we meet regularly with an in-house team, and it's everybody from fire and police planning, economic development. Um, so all of the departments are represented around the table as we're reviewing the plans as they move forward through the process. So this evening, we're kind of getting towards the final stages of the public review process before the plans go to council for review and approval. And so if it pleases the commission this evening, what we'd like to do, because there are two rather large projects, is to be able to present the plans to you one at a time and then open up the public hearings independently for each one of the plans. Is that okay if we proceed in that manner? Oh, on the speaker cards, they really haven't indicated which one they want to talk about. So oh. why don't you talk about them both and then we'll hear from the public. Sounds good. All right, so we're gonna start with the Linear Park Trail. Um, so a couple of points about this plan in the study area. Here we go. So the plan focuses on the portion of the trail that's from Pennsylvania Avenue to Dover Avenue. and I can tell you that when we put the call out for various design firms um, to compete for this project, what set Pinto and partner, Partners apart from the other proposals was the lens through which they wanted to look at this project. And it isn't just, about, it isn't just a park beautification and renovation project. It really talks about the influence of the linear park trail through this entire study area. And so the length of the trail includes a variety of different land uses. It's commercial to residential. There's um, some cemetery space in there. And so you'll see in tonight's presentation how the plan is mindful in the ways the various sections or nodes along the trail interact with the surrounding neighborhoods and actually how the surrounding neighborhoods influence the trail plan as well. And it was very, very interesting, the approach that Pinto and partners took. Um, they worked with a team of specialists that included urban design and economics, landscape architecture, civil engineering, planning, and community engagement in order to take this comprehensive look at this study area. So in order to get us to this point this evening, we've had quite extensive public outreach around the public, um, around the project. We had um, several stakeholder meetings, and those stakeholders included adjacent landowners and also different partner agencies that could be impacted by the project, including the school district, um, transit systems, county public health, there were others. We've also, had a two, we've also had two online surveys that were available in both Spanish and English. Um, the first one was an initial survey to ask what the people wanted to see, um, what they wanted to see us achieve with this project, with the linear park activation. And with a recent survey, we actually asked for input and feedback on the plan that's going to be presented to you tonight. And we also held a public workshop. Um, we held that at National Night Out in a location that was somewhat proximate to the trail. And again, we presented the information in Spanish and English and really directly engaged with the community about the concepts, again, that are being discussed this evening. So the results that we present to you tonight, we're pretty excited about. It's a vision for Central Fairfield that really does encourage a new vitality in the area. And so I would like to where'd you go? Oh. <laughs> introduce Prakash Pinto, who will present the plan to you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm a Prakash Pinto, I'm managing partner with Pinto and Partners. And as Anne mentioned, there's a large team behind this. Um, and uh, without any further, I'll get uh, to it. So I just want to give a little history of the linear park. Um, uh, if you you can see it. Uh, the park is right at this. It was a former rail line here. This photo is from the 1940s. Um, and uh, that's where, where we started uh, looking at this project. Uh, I will say in 1975, there was a very extensive study done. 
And uh, the result of that was the actual bike path that's through the corridor as it is right now. Um, but much of the uh, vision was unrealized and there's been a lot of changes that's happened. So this was a very good update um, uh, for that plan. Uh, there's existing character along the ex uh, corridor. Uh, there's parking lots. Um, it moves through different kinds of land uses, uh, the cemetery. Uh, and of course, though, uh, the trail itself, um, there's a lot of potential there um, that seems unrealized. And that's something our team worked closely with the city and the community in, in our workshops and with stakeholders to uh, evolve. There were a number of key issues. Um, these are some key ones, the very long blocks. Um, and I'll show you that in the slide later. Uh, and very few connections. And I think that contributes to the sense of um, how people feel very unsafe. That was one of the really key comments uh, from the public throughout this entire process, the safety factor. Um, how to revitalize key nodes and intersections. So our approach, as Ann mentioned, we came at this from a more macro scale, looking down and how to actually look at the corridor and, and how it could help revitalize North Texas Street or Pennsylvania and, 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 and help create something in Central Fairfield. Uh, there's some development encroachment uh, that's been both negative and positive. Uh, I mentioned earlier crime and safety. Um, the fence is along the corridor in disrepair and that contributes to a sense of um, that it's, it's, it's not uh, defined, it's unsafe, um, the neighbors feel unsafe, the residents there. And then how we actually, there's no destination too, that's a key problem. And so that's one thing we did look at in the, in the course of this study. Uh, so there's some key goals and objectives that evolved in the work with the stakeholders in the community. Uh, I won't read through all of these, but, it, but generally it was to improve, there's a number of vacant sites. Uh, number of schools direct, in direct proximity of the corridor, which is very interesting. Um, how to create open space destinations, uh, really improve the regional and local mobility. Uh, the Bike Coalition was a big stakeholder in this. Um, how to develop uh, public health opportunities uh, along the linear park corridor. Uh, wayfinding how to enhance that so people know where they're going, where the destinations are. And as I mentioned before, public safety, and I, I can't emphasize that enough. And, uh, so, we, so we looked at this through many different lenses, uh, civil engineering, urban planning, urban design, but also economic. And there are some key things that we found. Uh, so just some key facts. Uh, the study area population was about 7,300. Uh, households are slightly uh, less likely to, uh, than the city to be average families with home ownership rate only about 35%, much lower than the city. So there are a lot of renters in this area. Uh, lower proportion of single family housing units, but higher proportion of higher density housing. So there's a lot more people living in direct proximity of the corridor actually. Uh, the median income is, is significantly lower than the citywide medium income. And, and of course, the population, we did a demographic study. Um, there, there's a lot of data on this, but gen generally, it's a very diverse um, population. We did, uh, this is just one analysis that we did, and you can see the, the uh, downtown is a really kind of refined, old type block structure, very walkable. And you can see the blocks in the corridor. This is the corridor itself. They're quite long, a lot of um, cul-de-sacs, dead ends. So there's very little perme um, permeable passage between the, the neighborhoods and the, and the corridor. Uh, this is a, a GIS uh, information uh, from all, all the data we had. It, 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 it shows the medium to high density to low density patterns uh, throughout. We, we did also for commercial and, and a number of different studies. I just thought I'd show you one. Um, housing stock characteristics we looked at for the steady area versus the city of Fairfield. So you can see um, generally what this is telling you there, that there's uh, less single family, more higher density uh, units um, in, in, the, in the study area. And then we looked at the overall existing land uses. This might, is a little hard to see. The 
Linear Park itself here is 21 acres, so that's relative to the land area of the different uses. So uh, these three are the residential, and then there's public uh, imp um, and um, commercial. I think uh, I can't read that. I have it blown up. Uh, through, through commercial office and um, co regional commercial, which is really the Solano Town Center here. So really what this is telling us, there's quite a bit of diversity of land uses. We charted all the schools and transit lines as part of our, our overall analysis. It's very interesting. Here's the corridor, and you can see in blue the, the elementary, secondary schools, and private schools really in close proximity. Um, and we had some very good meetings with the school district itself in how to help them. Uh, there's an issue with uh, drop-offs at schools, a lot of traffic congestion. And one idea was to, to, to think about developing a walking school bus drop-off area along the linear park where then people w w could walk to the, to the various schools. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. We developed a site opportunities uh, mapping, and th uh, there's a lot of information here. Generally, what, what the takeaway from this was that there's downtown Fairfield and the Civic Center, which is actually very cl in close proximity to the linear park corridor, and we started to explore some kind of connections along Webster uh, and Richards Court to the, to the, to the, corridor, to the corridor, uh, how to integrate the town center. There were a lot of vacant sites, too, up near the North Texas Street, where the bowling, former bowling alley uh, is. And then also how to really extend this all the way across Travis and then extend to the, the transit center, actually. To the transit center. Uh, these are just some aerials. Uh, I want to thank the local television station who got us lots of great aerials, actually. Um, and. Uh, uh, of, of, of the site, and you can see this is near the North Texas Street, the bowling alley sites to the, to the left. And then this is one of the uh, connections, potential connections, the linear trails. This is Richard's Court right near the North Bay Medical Center. Um, the linear trail is just on the other side of the fence there. So during the course of this project, we developed the planning framework. Um, briefly, this was all the things I mentioned before, which is this, the schools, identifying the schools, Solano Town Center, the downtown Civic Center connections, but looking at North Texas Street as a commercial uh, and how to increase its vibrancy and, and to create you know, some key uh, destinations both at North Texas and at Pennsylvania. So I'm going to move into the concept plan that our team with the city uh, looked at breaking it up into kind of five uh, areas. And it's about a mile long, so it's quite long. But each was influenced by its adjacent land uses um, and, uh, and what it could also do for those uh, land uses. I'll go through each of, each of them uh, individually. But throughout all of them, there are program threads. These things repeat themselves. So there's the pedestrian bike trail, which is there. Now it's 10 feet wide. We proposed widening it to 15 uh, to create a jogging area, a walking area, and a bike area. It's, a, it's safer, it's a best practice, and it's going to be more generous. Uh, we want to look at increasing the landscape and habitat opportunities, um, and I'll, I'll show you that, uh, how we've integrated those. How we develop community gardens and building on the agricultural history of that corridor was important. Um, Creating gateways uh, and identifying places for public art was important. Um, recreation, fitness, and play, uh, we, we, that was a key component uh, of that. Um, remembering history, as I mentioned, not only the agricultural history, but there's also a, a, a cemetery. The cemetery district is a key stakeholder. And there is a lot of history associated with that. Oh. And then lighting, safety, and security. Uh, currently, the linear park's not lit, and so we are proposing lighting that as well, um, and also looking at new fences uh, and, and security systems. So I'm going to start with uh, node one. We broke this into in the nodes, and this is the first node. This is Pennsylvania Avenue, Solano Town Center is right here. Looking at a new gateway plaza that's more visible 
from the street, I think that's one of the key aspects is that you can pass by the linear park and not know that you've passed by it. So we want to actually highlight that. Um, creating an area for temporary events, but really a more public space. Uh, moving um, uh, eastward, developing a, a set of community gardens. And one thing that's associated around here, there's senior uh, facilities here, and then there's higher density housing to the north. And so there's some opportunities here to take advantage of those land uses. Um, and that's one thing um, that we looked at for these kinds of programs. One note, uh, there is a 40 foot wide de uh, Department of Water Resources uh, pipe that runs right down the center of this. And so there were a number of restrictions. This is a perspective, ground view looking west uh, towards Pennsylvania Avenue. Part of it was to develop gateways that built on the rail history and using water towers or there's some old abandoned ones that <laughs> we were offered uh, to, to put here in, in its place. And so there's some found objects that we could use or public art uh, installations as well as temporary events here. This, is, this happens to be food truck, but it could be a number of different things. But we thought this could be a very visible place uh, from a very uh, busy intersection, Travis and Pennsylvania. Moving between Fairfield and Union. Did, here did, you, is, did you address any of, it, of, of how you connect these? For example, that's a very difficult connection from there across Pennsylvania and Travis Boulevard. Did yeah. You, did you address that in the we report? We did, and I'll show I, it. I haven't, didn't read it. Uh, uh, we did, I'll show it to you in the intersections. We worked with the trans traffic engineer for the city in how to try to help make that connection because that was a key connection. So I'll, I'll show it to you in a, in a, when we get to the intersections. Uh, moving uh, from Fairfield, um, well, also just to answer your question before I move on, we're looking at also upgrading all the intersections across all the streets to make them safer because that was another issue that we found um, in terms of signalization and better crosswalks and more visibility. Um, so that, th that was all part of an integrated package. Uh, from Fairfield Avenue, we looked at creating a you know, children's playground and, and as I mentioned earlier, walking school bus drop-off area here, um, but associating that with uh, educational ag gardens and a facility that the school district let us use part of their site for. And that was a really important um, collaboration where the, this facility might have classrooms or learn about uh, food or how to grow food. Um, we're doing this program in Berkeley that called the Edible Schoolyard and it's in a number of different school districts. And one really of the key things is having space to show and grow different kinds of gardens. And so the Linear Park was a great place to try to start doing this. Uh, looking at how we might do orchard. And then towards the eastern side of it was the, the cemetery. And working with the cemetery, they talked about having memorial walls and um, how people could actually uh, come there to celebrate events, uh, but also make, provide some security, because security is also an issue. And right now it's not. Um, um, I think I did something here. Uh, okay. This is a view from the. Just one quick question yeah. on the on the um, cemetery. Mm -hmm. How did, how did you address with them the fencing? Uh, we talked with them. We actually had a meeting with them, and they talked about their issues. And they had proposed a fence a number of years ago about how to do it. But we looked at trying to do it with stone walls and maybe movable fences that would open during the day and then allow them to close at night. This is still conceptual. It's still a conceptual plan. But we talked through a number of different um, ideas uh, to how to give them that sense of security, particularly at night, but also open it up. Well, I'm just more interested in, in who's paying. Oh, well, that's a good question. I, I, that, that's something that's uh, to be determined okay. still. Uh, this is a view uh, looking from Fairfield Avenue uh, 
uh, towards the gardens, and this is the facility here and the bike trail through here. Um, and and the play, we, we always try to put a playground next to where there might be a drop off here and make them more visible also to the street. Uh, so there's some uh, aspect of safety associated with it as well. The next segment is between Union and North Texas Street. And this is a more relatively quieter area. It's surrounded by single family homes. Um, but there is Union Creek in the middle of, uh, of it uh, that is uh, a little underutilized. Uh, and part of our team, our landscape and our ecologists are looking at trying to revive it in a way and develop a more riparian corridor through here uh, to help the ecology and the drainage as well. We're looking at a smaller dog, dog park here for the neighborhood and there's an existing connection that here that's been closed off and we're looking at some point to open it up. Now, we've worked with the Fairfield Police Department and we're not trying to propose opening it up all at once, but slowly and maybe through tests, see how we could, once the programs get established to open up the corridor to the adjacent neighborhoods. And of course that would happen more creatively over time. As you cross North Texas Street, uh, this is where a lot of the vacant sites, the city actually owns this site here, the old bowling alley site. And um, the idea for this is to actually put uh, more multi-purpose fields here with a, a facility and parking off North Texas Street, uh, ball courts, um, and, and another entry kind of plaza here to give it some visibility from North Texas. Um, and uh, there's also a number of different kind of fitness activities associated with this, but really that would be the kind of uh, theme of this particular node. Now this the city's, is, city's had that up for sale or development for quite a while, and I'm assuming that, Dave, you guys have reviewed this? Because I've never seen this plan before for the old bowling alley site. Tonight is where it's getting rolled out as a concept. But yes, that, yes, our our successor agency staff is aware of this. They're the they're the agency that actually owns that property, so they're involved in in these plans and discussions. Okay. And then um, the it's a very long portion, um, and so having some recreational activity there was important. On the on the other portion, uh, we're looking at a much larger dark dog park, uh, and we were given a minimum four acre for it, which is what this would be. So it's a it's a large area. The bike trail would be more on one side, and then some additional community gardens would fill in uh, mid block and then a smaller playground which would be associated with the church preschool that's currently in, uh, existing now then to Dover which is the edge boundary of our project area. Uh, to get back to your question about intersections we looked at these with the city um, uh, all of them Fairfield, Union, Pennsylvania, Travis. I will say specifically from Pennsylvania to the other uh, part of the linear park to cross Travis, we're looking at a dedicated trail uh, on, on the eastern side and then crossing along the uh, northern edge of, or I guess that's the eastern edge of Travis here to the crosswalk and then to the linear park where it continues this way. And there's actually enough right of way to do that. Um, it's by the, I guess there's a auto tire repair place that's got its back here gas station. Yeah, and that was always a problem. In the, in the 75 plan, they tried to take this on too. They actually created a mid-block crossing here and then had uh, you cross through the Solano Town Center and then uh, here. Although when we talked to the city and worked with the city, there was a lot of uh, issues about using um, private property to to make that connection. That was one of the problems with the 75 plan. So this actually uses all the existing kind of right of way uh, in, the, in the public realm, the public side, uh, which we think will work. And have, we've talked to the city and vetted this through them as well. Uh, 
Um, I mentioned earlier the fences. Uh, this is a kind of standard condition view, um, and it does contribute to the, you know, the quality of why people don't come here or feel it's unsafe. Uh, and there's a number of other reasons, but this is a, a primary reason as well. So this is what we're looking at to uh, uh, develop a CMU wall along this edge that would be planted. Uh, trees and then more native landscape. You know, there would be other programs, but of course we're trying to see how we would actually start to create some kind of um, safety and security for the residents. At some point, if they wanted to create a gate, we would, you know, they would be allowed to do that into the into the corridor. Uh, so there's many different options that could happen once we um, get kind of the edges uh, defined. We also developed some preliminary signage uh, and wayfinding. That, that's a key issue with the uh, linear park uh, and making it more visible, um, taller, brighter. Uh, we, we looked at playing with signage from the old rail uh, markers um, to bring back that history. Of course, there would be history on perhaps uh, and historical uh, information on some markers and then more specific trail markers as well. Um, and and uh, we also had ideas that the distances to different destinations, so distance to downtown or Solano Town Center, you know, would also help people in terms of way and finding. And that, that is the presentation, if you have any questions. Any commissioners have any other questions? Commissioner Walker. So uh, a, a, couple, a couple of things here is um, uh, the width of the path. Um, has the police department reviewed those and it, is it wide enough for them to get a patrol car down? Yes, they've, they've looked at it. Right, right now they can get a van down the 10 foot, uh, but 15 is, is, a, is good. And we've changed it. We, we had part of it as DG, but now it's all concrete, so they can actually drive down it. So they've reviewed it, and, and they can get vehicles yes. up and down there for going. Um, on the lighting, you know, we're going to have some issues with the lighting depending on how you have it with the neighbors. So how, how did we address the overflow of lighting from the park into the neighbors' houses? Well, these are the light standards. They're every 100 feet. And they are similar to the fixtures used at uh, Donnell. Where? Donnell. Don Donnell. Donnell Garden. Well, Donnell Burton. Yeah, it's the city's nature center uh, over in the Rolling Hills neighborhood right. on the west side. Um, we had the same problem uh, in Berkeley on our Ohlone Trail because it's actually only um, 75 feet wide and there's residents right on. There's no yards. They're right on. Uh, we used uh, restrictor plates uh, and, and defined lighting. There's ways to, to mitigate the, the, the overspill of light uh, lighting uh, onto the residents. So I, I'm, I think we're, we're not at that point. We're still in concept, but there is some definite solutions in terms of how some to Some of the down lighting, if you take an example of the, um, the old Cadnessel Shopping Center, where th that down lighting that the city had them put in was totally ineffective and they had to redo that lighting. So there's a fine line between it going over to the other neighbors and then not bright enough right, that right. it makes any sense to even have it there. So right. I hope we'll look at that and, yes, and we will. Uh, make sure we do that. Um, did you look at uh, the, in your report anywhere about overpassing any of these, these streets? <laughs> you know, the 75 plan actually had two overpasses, um, one at Pennsylvania and one at North Texas. Um, our feeling is uh, there's two reasons. One was cost. It's just prohibitively not feasible. Um, the second is um, our philosophy is that it's better to keep people on the same plane and figure out how to do crossings safer. Um, when you start to separate pedestrian paths over, you start to create places where people can't escape in unsafe conditions. And so it was a, you know, we, our team definitely talked about it, but we really came back to it should be at one level for a number of different reasons. And then the um, last item, or item I have is um, what kind of security are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, camera systems? Are we talking about um, 
Sergeant, maybe you can correct me in my language here. They have that sound device where if a shot goes off, it helps you identify it. What, say it again. Shot yeah. Have, have we looked at either, those, those two items in the plan? Because I'm reading through it. I mean, we, we say we're talking about security, but I don't see anything about talking about cameras that uh, can be re reviewed of this area on a regular basis and this type of uh, device that will allow police to identify immediately where there's an issue? Right. Uh, this plan is still at a conceptual level. It's, 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 you know, we're still looking at these details. However, we have talked about uh, first lighting. Um, uh, there are uh, C CCTV kind of cameras. There are systems also that we were told about that's being utilized in other parts of the linear park corridor uh, that emit a sound so that um, people don't stay in certain areas. They're, they're, they kind of move on to other areas. So those are the systems that we're talking about. How they're deployed, how they're arrayed, that's still something for the next level of design. Um, but we're looking at all, we're, 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 we're actually incorporating all of those right now. But before you design it, you got to make sure that you have the correct, um, whether it's piping or whether it's mm -hmm. wireless, whatever the case may be, that you n not going back in and re tearing it up to put in a system that we should have that, whatever it is that they need to do that system. Yes, and I would hope during the design development or the next sta stage that that would definitely be considered as part of the next stage of the development of this plan. And in the landscape, my last one is the landscaping. Um, obviously, we're going to have a huge problem here with homeless. And depending on how that landscaping is done and how it's done correctly, so there's not a hiding spot, it's not places where people can hang out, but it's more open where uh, the police can drive by, whether it's on one of the main streets or actually drive down and be able to see everything without hiding places. Right. And that, Take that in consideration? Yes, that's been definitely uh, in the consideration. And we uh, would intend any trees to be, uh, their skirts would be lifted so that there's clear visual access underneath them. Another part of it, I mentioned about the DWR right of way. There are very restrictive guidelines on what plant materials can actually be used and no, no real deep rooted trees, no big trees. So there's a lot of landscape requirements already in a significant part of the linear park. That's all my questions, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Pattis. So a couple of things. Um, the overall timing, I, since obviously, you know, budget is always a concern and I imagine this is going to take quite a while. What are you thinking where we're going to start? What's going to be the first phase, second phase? Have you got to that point yet? We're not at that point. That's a very good question. Um, I think um, I think we need to kind of our, our, our focus was to develop the overall vision and the concept plan and now start to look at where the key areas are. My personal preference would be to start where the very public areas, so maybe Pennsylvania, you know, right at Pennsylvania and North Texas might be a good place to start and test things and then let those grow together uh, through the rest of the, the linear park. But, but I, to answer your question, it's really too early in this process to kind of start identifying that. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Next is a presentation on the uh, Allen Witt Park renovation plan. Uh, one quick question, Mr. Chairman, if sure. I can, of uh, the department. Have you, um, in all of these garden, I forgot her name. Ann Matola. The, uh, these gardens and things like that mm -hmm. are usually uh, staff um, uh, dedicated to whether you sign out the space or so forth. Have you put your numbers in and things of what it's going to cost you for staff uh, to maintain these things and to manage them? Yeah, actually, well, what we're doing right now, we're, we're doing um, a bit of outreach to try to identify partners. So a lot of the activation of both parks will be dependent on partnerships. Okay. And so once we can understand that, then we can better um, identify what that cost would actually be to the city and the city resources necessary. Sorry, just, uh, the mouse is not cooperating. Awesome. There we go. Super. 
Okay, so the second project that we wanted to um, present the concept for tonight is the Allen Whit Park project. And one of the unique things about this park, um, everybody knows the Allen Whit Park project, but what's very, the, the park itself, but what's very interesting, what was interesting to me as a new director coming here is that there was never a master plan for this park. Um, and it developed to contain a lot of really wonderful amenities. But if you were to design the park with these amenities today, they would follow different standards, and a lot of new design follows SEPTID standards, which is the crime prevention through environmental design. And so things probably would have been reconfigured differently, um, and there would be a, a little bit more of a thoughtfulness to you know, the way it undulates and um, certain amenities that really are kind of like tucked away in the park and don't have a lot of ability for people, including public safety, to access and to go through a park. And so when we were um, given this really wonderful council goal, the Community Spaces Initiative, it presented an opportunity for us to take a holistic look at the park. And so that's what we did with the help of Calendar Associates. And so what we were looking to do with Allen Whit Park is to create a comprehensive park plan that was really a vision for the future of the park. And in tonight's presentation, you'll also see that in addition to really kind of maximizing the different areas that are dedicated to the sports use and that we are, um, that we are able to provide in partnership with a number of sports user groups, we've also identified how to program spaces which are kind of unprogrammed and passive use areas right now in order to, again, to maximize the use of the park. And possibly most importantly, um, you'll see a plan that is informed kind of by SEPTA design and with this, we're gonna improve the safety in the park and reduce the blight and crime. Um, also, uh, there's a lot of thoughtfulness in the way we're going about this so that we can control the maintenance costs um, in the future. As we review this plan, also keep in mind the proximity to the heart of Fairfield plan. Um, that also had a lot of community in input um, in designing the heart of Fairfield. And some of what you see in this park design, in the Allen Whit Park design, was informed by that, particularly the addition of some community gathering spaces. One of the things I just wanted to quickly review is that prior to this um, formally being developed as a council goal in our ability to work on more dedicated focused concept plans, uh, we did put a lot, of, um, a lot of improvements into the park over the last two years year and a half, um, and they include um, increased and improved pathway and parking lot lighting. We did increase the number of security cameras and also added some license plate readers to the park. Um, we also added loitering deterrent devices. You may know them by mosquitoes. Police patrol has increased, and also uh, we did add a considerable amount of fencing around the um, Pacific Little League parks as well in order to, take, um, to address some safety concerns in that area. So at this point, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Ben Woodside from Calendar Associates. Great, thank you. Great, I appreciate the opportunity to, to pr present this wonderful project. What a special place this is in the, in the heart of Fairfield, and it's been a great, process all the way through what this is it's kind of hard to read up there but what it re represents is the process that we've been through working with the city working in the community to date which is right we're here with the, the planning commission presentation throughout this whole process so far we've had multiple layers of input from folks whether it's dealing with the stakeholders that are on the site using the site love the site dealing with the community at large to see how can we solve problems, how can we look to the future, and then working with the city staff. The city staff here is great to work with, very well represented by all those involved that'll have a stake in the project as it moves forward. So using all that input, we have the plan that we're gonna be presenting to you this evening. Not being said that it's set in stone, that the idea is to be able to present it to you, hear the comments and suggestions, moving on to council, and hopefully having the master plan adopted soon on that. When we look at the existing park, building off of what Ann said, generally speaking, this is the, looking at from the, from the plan view, north being up, Woolner down here, Wex, Texas, and there's the entry, aquatic complex and the gym. I'm gonna be showing you many versions of this plan, so to orient you, the plans are always the same. What she's explaining is, in the old way of designing parks, you want to escape from the perimeter to get away from out the outside, and so a lot of things were in the middle. 
We heard time and time again about people reminiscing about the rocket ship and the playground and how it was an escape from the surroundings to the inside. Well, those same design practices these days turn into hiding places, turn into places where people don't feel safe. So in general, between the, the canopy and the mounds on the outside, it's not very visible. But you add to that areas of the park that are well, very well used and very well loved, whether it's the, the ball field, skate park, tennis courts, there's these other uses that are currently being used that we needed to address and listen to their concerns and thoughts for the, in the present and in the future. We take those comments and thoughts and needs, we had online surveys, we had individual workshops with folks and started developing these site opportunities and constraints. How do we make the site better? And some things that started floating to the top is trying to make it a more centrally focused, easily policeable, having better access through the middle of the park, gathering up amenities uh, instead of having them spread throughout. Um, other opportunities, of course, making it sustainable, not just from the environmental point of view, but from budgetary, uh, but for, and also you know, maintenance of this facility long term. Um, as you start looking at those opportunities and constraints, design objectives start coming together. And it seemed to be, as we move through it, pretty clear that there needed to be a park with basically two sides a more sports opportunity area where we're expanding upon the existing sport uses that are there, improving those ne for those needs, and then also having this park opportunity, this central gathering place, that area bringing the community back into the park to love it, to have community gatherings, playgrounds, things like that in the middle. We asked the, the community, what types of elements would you like to see in the park? And we developed a program of all those amenities, whether it be a jogging path, additional parking, light, security, a lot of things you talked about on linear park tour was brought up by the public for this park as well. We developed this program and then developed two park amenities, amenities, alternatives A, or excuse me, alternatives, alternatives A and then alternative B. Both alternatives had the same list of those program elements well, I'm going to walk you guys you folks through in a minute but it was organized slightly different one had a more vehicular organized central one had a more pedestrian organized central focused as well as different placements of parking and different uh, organizations of those items we t we did these alternatives presented them to the public gathered feedback and then that's what was then rolled into what I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about is this preferred renovation plan so once again with West Texas, starting out at the large scale, improving the entrance off West Texas. Right now when you enter, it, it's kind of weird. How do you go? Either I'm going to the aquatic center or I'm not sure if I want to go to this side of the park. So creating this grand entrance, providing a better access and central vehicular so police can go through it. Even the paths themselves, having 10 foot wide paths so police can police through the middle of the park. Organizing, like you saw on that Opportunities Constraints map, improving the sports area, and then also improving this community-centered area. And then gathering up the, the similar uses together into different areas of the park, which I will, as I move through the presentation, start zooming in on those different zones. Safety, safety, safety. That was talked about from the very initial uh, survey that we put out online. How do we deal with these block views? How do we get better circulation? How do we deal with the vandalism and issues that are going on with the park? And so we developed from the beginning a, a, what we're calling this safety plan, working with PD, working with city. Like as we're developing this plan, how do we layer on these different safety features, whether it be cameras, whether it be additional lights, um, how they can get through the site, where we'll have control points. Those layers were added on those on the plan, including dealing with like the existing trees, raising up the tree canopies, clearing out some of the undergrowth vegetation to have clear sight lines in and through the park, and then also having these centralized gathering spaces. The big key is just like the main plan is activation, activation, activation. The more we can activate this park, the, the safer it will be. As we zoom in on the center of the area, the right now there's existing parking lot between the aquatic center and the sports center. What if that becomes this big central community green with a big picnic area slash bandstand where you can have, bring back 4th of July in the park or your big community events, controlling the public access so the cars are in the parking lot and then it's pedestrians out in this zone. 
that picnic shelter then becomes the center point to the community side of the park whether it be the, the family area where we have a multi-use turf field where you can do softball or pick up soccer or whatever, um, exercise equipment, large jogging trail along the path, these were things the community asked for to be added to the plan. P playground, the other thing what's a great opportunity on this site, unlike a neighborhood park, when it's a community park, you can put community-wide, community, -wide, community uh, attracting facilities or amenities such as the playground instead of just a small uh, playground what if it was this all-inclusive very large playground that brought people in all all over town so it's not just the families walking from the neighborhoods it could be somewhere where you bring in the kids on the bus and they spend some time there playing together and 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 learning together in these environments so the idea is having that as one of the big centerpieces of, of the site as we move down into the sports area improving the baseball zone and then also improving the softball zone, adding fields, improving fields, putting restroom buildings in, adding security fences around these things to, to keep them secure. One of the big challenges was there's a big building that's blocking views into the center of the park and the skate facility, so removing that building and then bringing a road through, extending that parking lot through so you can drive through and police all sides of the park. As we move up from that, um, on the exi existing sport court areas, that the existing fences on those tennis courts also create a visual barrier. If you're in the parking lot, it's hard to see past those fences. So sliding the fenced elements in down behind the building and then having the more open areas, instead of the basketball courts being on the back, put the basketball courts on the front, and that way you always have nice, clean sight lines through, through the park. And then some ideas came up with the community to add other things, such as adding pickleball and addressing the current needs of recreation needs or futsal. Um, so those, those additional amenities were added in the park throughout as well. Um, one of the biggest safety concerns was this northeast corner of the site. There's a lot of existing trees there that are really nice. It's hard to put in a lot of improvements there to discourage the activities that are going on there without looking at losing trees. And so one of the ideas that came with the community is what if we fenced off and created a dog park in that zone and then the, right now the road is coming along that back side. What if we push the road in, fence this off, and turn it into a nice dog park in that area? So that's what the plan currently reflects is something that would be light on those trees, um, easily policeable, and use, and use for dogs in that corner. So then zooming back out on the park, by using fences, whether it's the fences around the dog park, the fences around the existing zones here, the fences on the sports park, it limits the amount of actual open accessible park to this central core which becomes more easily policeable. Even city staff being in the, in the facilities there can see what's going on a lot clearer in the center of the space. Now what do we do? How do we implement this plan? It's a, it's a very ambitious plan on this site. It's a big site, right? That's the phase we're working on now. Um, how do we implement this first in phases? One of the initial things to address is how do we address the concerns that are going on at, at the skate park and other areas on the site. And so one of the interim uh, ideas working with staff is putting, removing the building uh, that's there blocking views, having better police access so they can get in around and, and, and access that area, and then installing a fence around that skate park and cleaning up that area. If that's phase one, which you see here, hopefully that's not the only part of first phase. Can that then be rolled into other phases on the side? And that's the phase we're at now, seeking input from you, seeking input from council on. If we start layering these phases, what phase should go first? What we've done here is broke it up into color-coded areas, similar to how we would have done like with Cordelia Community Park. These are, these are reasonable chunks of park improvement. <clears throat> That doesn't mean it can't change based on funding or if somebody decides to be a donor on the playground, that could go in first. Whatever, those things will be worked out as the funding gets worked out and as we hear input from you. But that's what these color codes are. These are equal, pretty reasonable chunks of the park. So for instance, maybe the first phase you want to do the entrance and realign this road and deal with this corner issue. Maybe the second phase is you want to help to increase the sports. That's how you would look at this, at this diagram. Along with that is starting to come up with the funding strategy, um, which is complex. 
and will be worked out over time. But that is the part we're in, like I said, in this plan. So when, when you're implementing a plan like this, you can't think about just from building it, it's also in the maintaining it. So working with the city, working with the different partners on that, working with council on the work plan priorities, CIP budget, cost recovery, rental facilities on the site, what, ga what grants can we get that are geared more to this type of facility? Specifically, even with grants and a lot of these things, we can't go after until we have this plan that's approved, that that's, uh, has the support from the community. And so that's a big key of getting this plan approved soon. And so it gives the, t the city the tool, the tool to then go out and start securing these, these funding opportunities for it. And then partnerships with the existing stakeholders, with Little League, with softball, with nonprofits. There's a lot of great local sources to help m implement this plan. And so next steps for us after this is taking the input from this preferred plan, revising it, and then going to, this, going to city council. And so that's where we're at in the process. And that's it for that. So I'm happy to open up to questions. I'll, I'll back up to that. <coughs> questions from commissioners? Commissioner Cohen. Question. Um, conceptually, with the entire plan as, it, as all these different phases, do you have an idea of what the cost would be to do the entire thing? Yeah, rough order magnitude on this is, is hard cost is somewhere around 20 to 25 million. So those chunks around there are like two to four million dollar chunks, similar to like the chunks you see like at Cordelia Park. And are there any phases of the phases that you had on this sheet here um, that are cheaper or more expensive than the others or? The way we've currently broke it up, the two big sports fields components, because they had a synthetic turf field, those would be larger. These are more like $4 million chunks, where some of these other are smaller, like in $2 million chunks. And those lines can blur and change depending on what we want to do and hit a goal on, you know, for and dollars. And my last question is, based on the issues that we have at the park now, if you were to take it in chunks of different phases, how would you approach that to guarantee the new phases are not going to be issues of blight while the, the other ones yeah, are there? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question, and that's the part we're still working on and want input on it. Current thought is it may be good to do this part here because that seems to be a big issue on this side. What's, we can't close the whole park down because there's so many active uses out there, but what if we did address this and then help what's going on with the skate park as that potential first phase? What's nice when you go into construction, you shut the park down for six months, that, the part that you're building on. So that alone would start changing what's going on in that location by having those folks there. And then if you kept those phases going, it would help change what's going on there. But, it, but the key is to bring people to it. That's the real key to keep it from coming back. And yeah. to do that, you have to make them feel safe and everything correct, else. Correct, correct. And then my last question is based on that skate park, and it may not be a question for you, but for staff to inquire with the city attorney's office, what is the liability the city has by having that skate park to determine if it's even necessary and we should have a skate park there? there was a, there's quite a bit of support to keep that same skate That's the existing skate park, to keep it there. I can't answer the question from the city's perspective on the liability of it, but it is the one that's been there and operating Thank in you. place. Other questions? Commissioner Walker. So, I, I, so it looks like you've eliminated essentially two ballparks? No. There's, there's, we've increased the number of ball fields. Which ones were you thinking of that have been? Well, you had four in the center of the, of the original park. Correct. You've moved two of them down here. Three down there, four. Correct. So softball would now have still four fields. One, two, three, four. I see, what you're going to do is, is use the corners of them using the field during one period of time and then have them overlap. That's correct. Okay. The idea being, when in, in talking with softball, they definitely need at least two dedicated fields. The other two can be more flexible. They would get the priority on it, but could be more flexible. That way, we have use on those all year round, um, depending on what's, what's needed there instead of Stakeholder, dedicated Stakeholders uses. have seen that. In a, correct, right. correct. And then um, we put the fence on the West Texas Street side, which eliminated the entrance to one place. Correct. Um, are we also looking at doing that on the Woolner Avenue side? Currently, we're not sure. Well, the, in essence, yes, because we have a sports field enclosure along that whole side, so there would only be two entrances on that side, yes. And, and uh, the police department has, re has uh, viewed this for, mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I'm thinking of that is that if you limit the area, it's easier for cameras and other mm -hmm. things to focus on the only ins and outs of the park. 
uh, instead of trying to cover with big white areas. So you are telling me that there's going to be fencing on this on the Wilner Avenue side except for the entrances. Correct. Basically, there will be a fence around this whole sports component here and then a fence around this whole sports component here. So there will only be openings here and here on that side. And uh, I, I heard the director say that she there was an increase in cameras. I'm assuming that mm -hmm. that was part of the, the, the police department has looked at the cameras for this, uh, this area and are satisfied with. Uh... Correct. This, back to the safety plan, I kind of went over it fast, but the dash lines indicate existing cameras. The d hard red lines indicated the new cameras that would be added so they had full coverage on the park once those are added. And did they look at this um, shot mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. sounding system also? Uh, that's that's I, that item specifically we haven't talked to them, but we can we'll add that to discussion but what's neat about what the way the city's set up is we meet with those folks every time we produce something before it goes to the public or to the community so they've always had input on that and we've addressed their items on that so we'll bring that up to them on it's, the it's a it's a great plan and it's a, a great move in, in the right direction but uh, yeah yeah as, as, we, as prior commissioner just talked about I mean uh, my company used to have its uh, annual summer mm -hmm. picnic in this area, we, we stopped doing it. Mm -hmm. We've heard that story a lot, churches so and, and all kinds. You can't kinds. go in there anymore. You can't have a, a peaceful place in there. So um, I don't know how we're going to end up controlling that or how you end up uh, designing it so it doesn't be a place for hangout, which it still is up by the park or the kids' park, uh, the number of people that just hang out there. So. Correct. And, and that, that's the real key is bringing all you folks back to it. That's the real success in any of these is making it something that people will come back. You, uh, did, did you also um, uh, do you also talk about ordinances and things for the park about how they're used and who can use them and mm -hmm. times? Is that all included in the study? Um, the, nothing other than what's the current times at the park. Um, has changed so the, the the lit uses would remain to what does your lit uses go to 10 like 10 o'clock 10 o'clock the rest of the park is not used at once it gets dark okay I'm, I'm just thinking of things like yeah. alcohol use and yeah it'd be the same ordinances same same all those same ordinances um, okay thank you yeah yeah any other questions can we get a bocce ball question? bocce ball yeah There is definitely room on that family side area underneath those there trees on that side to add goes, something like that. Goes with, goes with yeah. the pickleball. pickleball. Yeah, I have uh, right now. I have um, five speaker cards um, on this item in the linear park. So as I call your name, if you could come up and come to the podium, and also let us know whether you're um, talking about Allen Witt Park or the linear park or both. So the first speaker card I have is from uh, Jerry Wilkerson. So you put the button next to the bocce court. That's okay. I figured it out. We have bocce at the senior center. Anyway, um, Jerry Wilkerson, uh, 1455 uh, Oliver Road. I'm here representing the uh, Fairfield Sassoon Rotary Club and it's uh, 76 members. As most of you know, the Rotary Club, along with several other businesses here in Fairfield, were instrumental in getting that skate park built. When we first found out about the skate park uh, being removed, we weren't too excited about that because we believe that there are people in the town that use it. Uh, while there may be some misuse today, I think with the culture shift uh, over time that that park can go back to being a very viable asset for the community. And we like the plan, leaving it there. So these young folks, uh, and I shouldn't say all young, but I guess there's some older folks skate as well. But we do believe that the skate park should stay. We like the plan that's being presented. And that was the purpose I wanted to get up. And I won't take too much of your time because there's two more Rotarians behind me that want to speak to the same issue. So again, thank you for the design. Appreciate all the work the city did. The city had a difficult job in trying to get all the uh, groups to come to some sort of consensus, which they did. Um, and it, I thought it went very smoothly. So thank you for your time. Thank you.
Next up is Joe Schultes. time okay thank you I'm Joe Schultes with the uh, also with the Fairfield Sassoon Rotary Club and um, so 16 years ago I, I co-chaired this partnership me and Craig Bryan uh, to make this project happen uh, youth commission uh, came to the city uh, and uh, said boy there's a real need and we all saw a real need for a skate park in the city of Fairfield a lot of skaters were skating all over businesses uh, and it was getting to be a problem so we formed a uh, partnership with the city of Fairfield we said we would go ahead and uh, do the fundraising for naming rights, hence it's called the City of Fairfield Rotary Skate Park. Um, we worked with uh, Fred Biner and, and Curtis Hunt and John DiLorenzo, and uh, we cobbled together, we raised $250,000 in six months, and then we, there was a uh, state grant for parks, and there was also uh, some other funds that were not used for Boys and Girls Club years ago. We cobbled together about $750,000 and built a uh, first class uh, competition uh, skate park. Uh, so, uh, opened a great fanfare, and uh, over the years, uh, we, we realized that uh, there's been some problems with the skate park, but um, we uh, are still strongly in support of that skate park, and tonight you'll hear from a skater. Uh, a lot of kids, a lot of folks have had a lot of fun out there over the years. Uh, you know, over the years in this community, there have been uh, all kinds of fields, uh, all kinds of places for kids to go, basketball, football, but uh, you know, over the years, uh, you know, before the skate park was built, there was a disenfranchised group, uh, these skaters, and uh, so we were happy to uh, partner with the city of Fairfield and uh, make this uh, project happen. Uh, so um, uh, Rotary will continue to be a supporter. Uh, we, Fred Biner said, hey, would the, would the Rotary Club like to raise some money and put a, a fence around that thing? And uh, who knows, we'll continue to talk about that. And uh, so, so there you go. Um, thank you. And again, I just want to echo what Jerry said. Uh, Ann, Matola, and Fred have been great to work with, and the design team have been great to work with, with all the skate holders making adjustments. And I think the plans uh, with the road through, uh, better patrolling, uh, possibly one of our Rotarians also suggested a, uh, a police kiosk right in the middle. I think we have a lot of uh, improvements. Um, and alterations to the plan to make it much safer for all parties involved. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Abigail Wang. On right. Is it on? Okay. All right. So my name is Abigail Wang. I'm a public health certified registered nurse and a resident of Fairfield and a skateboarder. Um, when I heard that the Allen Witt Skate Park was going to be replaced with baseball fields, I was very disappointed. Um, there's a lot of people here right now that have been going there for seven years, uh, over 10 years. Um, you know, I just wanted to show you guys our perspective um, because we use the skate park daily. Um, you know, skateboarding is not like other sports. It's not like baseball. Um, people who skate, they didn't make the baseball team or they didn't want to try out their parents couldn't take them to practice They're, they didn't have time so it's very independent it's um more than just a sport uh people go there because they feel comfortable there's a huge community of skateboarders and they feel like a family um and they feel a sense of belonging um so to take that skate park away would mean a lot um a lot, it would bring a lot of disappointment and it would break up the community, the local community of the youth. Um, there's all types of generations. There's little kids and there's older people, like you guys said. So um, I like your guys' new plan to keep the skate park. I hope it stays because I know that this was kind of up for a discussion for a long time. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, next up is Vince Grisande. Hi, <clears throat> thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Vince Grisande. I'm a 
I'm here in two capacities. I'm a resident of Fairfield and uh, really happy with the plans that are going on here. Uh, I, we've had our children's birthday parties at Allenwood Park over the years. They're young adults now. My baby's 32. <laughs> and uh, it would be a great thing if I could have my grandkids' parties here. We don't dare go there now. But hopefully, uh, I have one grandson that's three years old and one on the way in December. So it would be a beautiful thing to rather celebrate their birthday that is there than my great-grandchildren's birthdays. <laughs> so if we can get this thing moving forward, that'd be great. Uh, my other capacity is I'm the uh, uh, president of Northern Solano Babe Ruth Baseball League, and we're neighbors with the uh, skateboard park. And just like anything, it just takes a few to, a few idiots to ruin things. But for the majority, most of people respect that area. But you know, one of the, I've offered suggestions to the uh, uh, commissioner and other pe folks on you know uh, having uh, regulations over there. You know, having the the fencing. You know, the Pacific Little Leagues controlled. Our field is controlled. Ours is the big baseball field here. And it just needs controls there. You see it in other fields, other cities, Vallejo here, the one in uh, Fairfield out in Cordelia has controls. So I think that's gonna be a beneficial thing. My concern here today is uh, as part of plan A, we have that one building that we normally held our concessions in. And uh, the one that's part that's going to be uh, raised. So uh, <clears throat> that's all good, but our needs are now. We don't have base or uh, bathroom facilities, and we can't run our concessions facilities because it's it's uh, unsanitary. The conditions that are going on there, and we've had some suggestions that we've shared that we'd like to see s until phase one goes into effect, if we can address certain issues that are going on at the uh, bathroom. And one is removing those walls that uh, separate and changing the expanded metal doors to steel doors. I think that'll save a lot of issues what's going on there. And we've offered that we would uh, maintain the bathrooms. Right now, the kids, they have no choice. They're just relieving themselves right there. And, you know, the, the stuff's there. I know I got the red light going, but I said I was here on two capacities, so hopefully I can go a little longer. <laughs> but uh, anyways, that's hopefully still out there. It can be addressed because I can see it could be a, a long way out before phase one goes into effect, and our, our needs are now. We just had a tournament, our All-Stars tournament in Woodland, California, and I'm like, what is going on here? These people actually love their kids in this community because it, it's a beautiful ballpark up there, bathrooms, concessions, and we hold a tournament here in our town and we don't even have decent bathrooms for our folks, you know, let alone concession stands. So these are things that I brought up and we've even had a meeting there with some of the folks there. Uh, honestly, it looked like a few guys my age getting ready to retire that don't want to take anything on. Yeah, it's going to take on more more work for folks to get this building up and running, but I'm here for the kids. Been here in the community for over 30 years, and I'm not gonna go away. And uh, I just wanna uh, share that out tonight. All right, thank you. Next up, um, I think the first name is Charles, but I'm not sure about that. Last name of Wood. Is that, I can't read that. Okay, oh, Chuck. Uh, hi, I'm Charles Wood. I'm also here uh, with the Rotarians. I was on the committee in 2000 and 2001 that raised the money to build this, and I have a long history in the, with this park, passing 50 years to when I played as a kid with a rocket to when I played t-ball in the park, uh, lifeguarded at the swim center. It was a little different then, and, uh, uh, and uh, watched my kid play baseball there. Um, 
what uh, I want to thank uh, Director Matilda and Ben with Colander's Associates because they really listened when we were very disappointed when we heard th that the skate park was not in the plans, but we resolved some issues uh, with that. And uh, when we raised the money for that park, we did it for not just for the youth, but for the businesses who were tired of people skating in their parking lot, skating on their stairs. And uh, it is a good place for for the right activity, and we did it. Uh, for a certain group of people. Uh, we understand there is a certain amount of undesirable element uh, using the skate park for purposes not what we intended it for. And we were glad that, that staff could see in their vision that there is a place for a skate park and, and a way to get the undesirable element out of there. Um, and that, and I would, uh, and my request is that we adopt this phase one that as soon as possible. Uh, what we understood before when we first, is, first started looking at this is that there were several incidents at the skate park. Well, you, you ask a few questions and it's not the skate park, it's next to the skate park and behind the building. So um, what we would like is, is to adopt this phase one as soon as possible so that we can get police vehicles that can get right up to the skate park, see what's going on, and not give people a building they can hide behind because that's what it's used for. Apparently, it's closed down, and and I don't, I, you know, I, I do think that uh, we need some place for the uh, restroom facilities for the baseball players, uh, but uh, I don't think they're using that one. So I would say put that in there if we can phase it, phase those things first. Um, because if it's a security issue and there's undesirable element there. Uh, let's get rid of them as soon as possible. Um, and I, uh, if I have time, I want to address uh, Commissioner Cohen's question about liability. Uh, this, uh, as I recall, and I'm not a tort lawyer, I don't do that. But, but as I recall, this we were able to do build the skate park, and the city was going to uh, going to uh, bought into it because back about when we did it, there was a statute passed that made it. Um, and it uh, sk said skateboarding, you're assuming your risk. You're, it's, an, it's a, I think, an extremely dangerous, dangerous uh, activity. So if you break your arm, it's on you. And, and so I don't think the city has a whole lot of liability. I mean, I think the city attorney might correct me, but that's my understanding is that, um, is that, it's, that it's not a, not a great liability to the city. But thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next up is, uh, James Johnson. Cool. Uh, good evening, James Johnson Jr., uh, residents of uh, Fairfield. Um, I, in general, I just wanted to comment that I've been a part of uh, several of the meetings for the Linear Park um, development and for Alan Witt. I mean, I really like the plans. I think that they're going to do um, a lot of good uh, once they're implemented. One thing I wanted to just offer consideration for consideration um, is implementing additional kind of opportunities for Wi-Fi and Internet for people. Um, as I think about my kids and the schools they go to, a lot of them, uh, two of my kids have an, have an either an iPad or a Chromebook. And as we go out and want to exercise and just kind of be outside of, of home, um, I want them to be able to um, explore and kind of play and get physical activity activity in. Another thing that I like for them to be able to do is go outside and just enjoy reading. And I totally appreciate that, um, you know, reading kind of like uh, historical books or whatever, where you're actually flipping through pages is not the most popular thing for my uh, five-year-old and for my nine-year-old. Um, but they, they, do, they definitely will do reading and much of, much of their um, homework assignments are assigned via their Chromebook and via their iPad. And so um, anyways, I just want to offer that for consideration, the additional kind of um, Wi-Fi spots. I think in Allen Wood, it's, a self, it's an enclosed area, so it's pretty straightforward, but even in the linear corridor, as we're thinking about additional security places, those could also be potential routers. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all the speaker cards I have. Are there any other uh, speakers? Oh. I don't think this is part of phase one, but um, I think the lighting at the skate park is a really big issue. Um, there's lights right now that I think they're on. Well, they're on while it's dark. I think they go off at like nine or something. Um, I'm just asking you guys to compare the skate park to skate parks uh, nearby, such as Napa, Berkeley, uh, Oakland, San Francisco. Their skate parks are 
very well maintained. They have lights on until 9 or 9.30 p.m. They're bright enough so that the skaters can skate, they can see. They're not gonna, um, it's not as likely for them to fall. Um, the, the lighting right now is really dim and it's just unsafe um, for the skateboarders. So brighter lights is really important. And I know there's an issue with the trash. I think um, the homeless come to collect a lot of recyclables. Even people that aren't homeless will come to collect the recyclables. I've heard complaints about skaters uh, littering, but they actually are considering the people that are gonna, gonna come pick them up. Um, and also there's only one trash can, so it's constantly overflowing um, next to that bathroom. So just uh, maybe brand new trash cans, bigger recycle bins, so that um, we can have a designated area for those people to collect them. Um, but yeah, that's it. All right, thank you. All right, I'll turn it back to the staff. Um, are there any closing comments from staff? And ask me to just to make sure we're clear. And I love the discussion about the skate park, but this is the plan that we are moving forward with that has that included. So it's not a discussion if it should be there or not there at this point. It's 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 in the plan. So I think that's good news. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from commissioners? Okay, Commissioner Walker for Ann. So we've designed some areas, especially in, I think that's the Pacific Little League area there, where we've moved the bathroom in between the fields, and then that gets locked up. The, even the entrance to that area gets locked up when it's not being used. Mm -hmm. um, and that's always been one of the problem w with these fields is the access, especially for the young kids, to the bathroom. Should we not also look at, uh, on the bathroom issue, of trying to include one for the Babe Ruth field where they can include their concession stand and, because we're just doing the, um, the new bathrooms that aren't multiple, just one person at a time, and, and try to include one also in there so that when they're done, it also gets locked up? Yeah, and I think it's really important because these, this is actually a rather detailed concept plan, but a lot of the specific amenities and support amenities they need to be considered when we actually get to the final design for those okay, so that would be great i think if we could do that because then <coughs> the the organizations that use them would pay more attention to them and and uh, and make sure they're they're taken care of i missed the detail evidently it's in there <laughs> yeah it's okay it's okay yeah so there's we're proposing three new restroom buildings yeah, I, I see the numbers so you got that that one and that one right but i don't i don't see the one that. uh for there Correct. To make that facility a better used facility, and then maybe you can tie in, like you, like we used to have at the uh, the field um, that's being taken out with the concession stand, and and try to put the restrooms together. Yeah, that's a great comment. Uh, the initial thought in talking with those groups is that they would both share this one, and these folks would have access to that and this facility was being used, so we wouldn't have to put the fourth building in there, but it could be a possibility to talk about. They also, this is included the same fence zone where they could use the one over on this side as well. But that's, that's still a great comment, we can, we'll consider that. Commissioner Cohen. So for clarification on the, not the bathroom, but on the concession stand aspect of things for the Babe Ruth and the Little League, is that, where in this plan is that in? Is there only one for all of these fields? There would be two, restroom slash concession areas one that's serving this side of it and then one serving this side over here okay and with this phase one of t demolishing the existing one that i understand which is basically not being used now what is the plan to put one in there so the babe ruth and the little league does have a concession i know that's, little league is kind of a temporary thing they have there now yeah that's a that's a great point that's a great discussion i think it needs to be included in that the phasing plan if it goes in maybe we need to look at putting in that restroom building i think it's the essential these leagues are dependent upon that the, mm -hmm. you know especially in babe ruth where you're not you're bringing people from outside the city they, they, they get hungry if it gets hot in the, in the summertime i mean it's 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 essential for their organization to make money and, and stay stay afloat um the the comment i have regarding the skate park i don't want it to be misconceived that i don't want the skate park the skate park, I think, from what I've heard here, has had issues. Converse to the skate park that's been put in place over there in the Cordelia Park next to the Tri-Valley Fields has never, from what I've seen, has never had an issue. There's no graffiti there. There's not a bunch of people loitering around there. Everyone's out there having a great time. I think the difference is the proximity to the road, the visibility. You know, it's, it's not hidden. It's not back there where people can't see it. So I think this is a great plan. I'm, I'm glad to hear, based on what the Rotarians have done in getting this there, that it's going to stay. And thank you, Chuck, for the response on the legal aspect. Any other comments? No? 
All right, so the next step for this is uh, the plan goes to the city council for their consideration. Yes. Yep. And you'll be taking the comments and discussion and incorporating your report to the council? That's correct. Okay. No, there's no action. This is a presentation to the commission. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good job. And, uh, you guys Thanks for you guys coming. It's nice to have you come. All right, our next item is item B, a public hearing on uh, the zoning ordinance updates for 2017. Our staff person is Brian Miller. Brian? Thank you, members of the commission, um, chairman. As the title of this ordinance suggests, this, at this zoning ordinance amendment action is related to state law and state mandates. Staff is recommending two ordinances that amend the Fairfield zoning ordinance to reflect state law. This is both recent state legislation as well as longer term policy direction from the state that's not been fully reflected in our existing zoning ordinance or, or procedures. Um, the first topic, the first ordinance is marijuana, or as the staff report makes clear, we're now calling it officially cannabis. Um, the new ordinance is intended to reflect the recent state legislative history that's outlined in your staff report. It focuses on relatively minor changes to language, including marijuana versus cannabis, clarifies the language and structure to correct references to state law, and addresses qualified patient use. It does not change fundamentally, though, the, the restrictions that are in the current code that were adopted by the last round of, of ordinances. Um, commercial marijuana production, distribution, and sale remains prohibited in Fairfield. Uh, Contrarywise, um, personal use of marijuana is not prohibited, and the growth indoors of personal of marijuana, limited marijuana for personal use, is permitted, continues to be permitted by the ordinance. Yes. The second ordinance addresses solar energy systems. Um, the Solar Rights Act dates all the way back to 1978 to encourage the installation of solar energy systems. Over it, the, the evolution of state legislation is basically to require administrative processing for solar energy system approvals and to also to limit review to health and safety standards. We largely do this. Um, the, the solar power systems are re reviewed by our building counter building staff and it is an administrative process. The planning review has been limited to a, a quick review of the system. However, we did have language in the ordinance that d d dealt with aesthetic issues, such as requiring flush-mounted solar systems, painting pipes, et cetera. It was brought to our attention that we really can't do that under state law, that we cannot regulate s solar systems based on aesthetic issues. We can only, our limit, our review is limited to health and safety standards, which our building division does. Um, so the, uh, the regulations in the ordinance, the changes in the ordinance today uh, clarify the city's process. Um, again, reflecting to a certain extent what we already do, but making it clear in the ordinance test. We eliminate the existing standards for non-health and safety issues as required by state law. We still have language recommending, for example, flush-mounted systems. That's still there, and to be honest, that is sort of the standard for residential systems now. I've seen one, maybe two systems in the years I've been working the public counter where they've not recently, where they've not used flush-mounted systems. So the actual impact will be minimal. In addition, the changes preserve the authority to review ground-mounted and parking lot solar systems primarily because we define those as not solar energy systems per se, but structures under our zoning ordinance. And we will continue to review these systems for their impacts on parking, landscaping, and, and trees as well. 
We're asking you to adopt the resolution tonight recommending the City Council approve the two ordinances addressing marijuana or cannabis and solar energy systems. Thank you. So the, the rules that you're putting under the solar system that are your recommendations, staff will remember, remember that they are not enforceable. Yes. Is that right? Um, that they won't. That they're not enforceable. Right. So if the people come in and say, I don't want to do that, the staff can't push them and say, no, you're going to do that. That is correct. All right. Any other questions for staff? All right. Um, I don't have any speaker cards on this. I'll open the public hearing, um, ask if anyone wants to speak on this. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and turn it back to the commission for any deliberation and a motion. All right, I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. All right, next up is the uh, director's report. Dave, do you have anything for the director's report? Yeah, I have uh, several items. Uh, passed out to you tonight uh, was a flyer. You can take a look at it. It is an invitation to attend the uh, annual planning commissioners conference uh, in the recent years a uh, number of our commissioners have actually we haven't sent commissioners due to budget cuts but we now have uh, full budget for sending commissioners to this conference it's not very expensive so uh, the conference is on Saturday December 2nd it uh, runs from 830 in the morning until 1 uh, you're all welcome to attend so what we would like to hear not tonight obviously but uh, preferably by the end of next week to hear if any of you are interested in attending so that uh, Cindy Spears on our staff can register you uh, in advance of the deadline here. I'll have Cindy send out an official query to you uh, but we wanted to make sure you had this uh, uh, in front of you tonight so you can look at it. Uh, some good sessions they're going to have uh, so would encourage you to attend. I'll be attending so uh, any of you who want to attend we can talk about carpooling. So look for that email from Cindy. Um, the next item, and you may have seen a news uh, item on <coughs> the city's train station, uh, it is nearing completion. Uh, there's no official date yet that we can report that it's officially going to be open. But if you haven't had a chance to take a drive out there, uh, you'll be really impressed to see instead of just an open field or a construction site, it looks like a nearly completed train station. And that's really going to be a great catalyst for all of the development that we expect to see out in that area under our train station specific plan. So we're really excited to see that. And as soon as I've got a date that I can announce uh, that it'll be open, I'll let you know. But uh, do you know, you know, after it opens, when trains will start stopping there? That, well, that's the thing. When it opens is when the trains will start stopping. Okay, there. so right when so it opens, they'll start. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and that's. You know when Dixon, they built the train station. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it'll be, I think it'll be quite a while before, <laughs> before they get the authorization. So yeah, so we're fortunate to, uh, to get that going. So I did want to just alert you to get, take a chance to go out there, see, and you'll see a lot of improvements to Vanden Road are under construction right now. So real transformation out in that area. Um, let's see, the other item I wanted to mention to you is that uh, we'll be continuing or closing the item tonight uh, to uh, the night before Thanksgiving, which I think is the 22nd. Uh, at the moment, I am 98% certain we're not going to have that meeting, but we'll know, by the, I think, by the end of the week, and we'll put out a notice as soon as we know if we're having that meeting or not for you so that if we're not going to have it, you'll know well in advance of uh, the night before Thanksgiving. We will have a pretty full agenda, though, I think, for the first meeting in December. So you can expect uh, uh, it would be the second Wednesday, correct? I think it's the 13th of December. So at a minimum, we're definitely going to have that meeting, and there will be a number of items on that agenda. So um, that's all I have. All right, thanks. Do any uh, commissioners have any information items? Commissioner McDonald. Yeah, a couple of things. First of all, I wanted to apologize to the commission for missing the last meeting. I was in Lake County, and if you've not driven from here to Lake County, there's about an hour and 10 minutes of just no cell service. And unfortunately, I got a really late start thinking I was going to be back in time and <coughs> was delayed. So I apologize for that and didn't have a way of connecting. Um, just a quick question for the attorney, if just more observation than anything. How does the city enforce 
a phrase that says cultivate cannabis cultivation shall not be conducted in the manner that constitutes public nuisance public nuisance may be deemed to exist if the cultivation produces light glare heat noise odor or vibrations aren't those all essentially subjective to i mean who <laughs> who says there's more light coming out of that window than necessary yeah it would be a code enforcement complaint based enforcement mechanism i you know if there are grow lights that are particularly bright gotcha. and shining into a neighbor's house i think that was that's the way that it would be reported okay um, makes sense i just <laughs> yeah pretty it's, tough a good, to, it's a good question the other thing is is on the homeowners um and more so just because interested in being able to take this back to the realtor association and be able to give them some insight on this if a property owner is leasing a property they probably should have in their agreement that that's not allowed specifically just knowing that it's not allowed or even saying that probably won't protect them in the in the event that it happens unless it's in the agreement that it's not allowed no 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 no. let's i'm a landlord and i want to rent my property i rent my property and in my rental agreement i don't specifically put in there that the cultivation of cannabis is not allowed on any terms whatsoever then if they do so and they break the law doing so i could be liable right well so the ordinance does require uh i believe it requires property owners approval um and i think that i saw that yeah that it asked for yeah. the property owners i'm just trying um, to get to the, the end of the day if if the renter is found liable for anything in the city or ordinances or any of that nature is the property mm -hmm. owner going to be held liable for that as well I, even if they don't have authorization and they didn't put it in that contract uh, that's a question that i can look into and yeah, report I'm back just curious um but yes including it in the the lease agreement other than that i wanted to say but kind of just ran out of time and i didn't want to waste everybody else's time but i think this park plan is phenomenal but like everything, it's going to take a community to make it happen, not just a, a commission or a council or some ambitious developers. Uh, it's really going to take the youth at the skate park protecting their own property there and making sure that they're picking up other people's trash, not just their own, um, and everybody working together and, and convincing your company to come back and, and try to have a picnic there again and, and staying with it. That's what's going to make a difference is if we can get to that level, aside from the money, which is, you know, if we get this approved and we can work on grants and get the Rotary Clubs and other organizations to contribute, maybe we can start making some of this happen, which would be phenomenal. That's all I have. Anything else? I'm done grandstanding. Uh, Chair Walker. One, oh. Public comment. Go ahead, Perry. Um, this is a personal thing. Uh, we just put solar on our house a few months ago, and the city was great. I mean, like three days later, they came out and did the, it took like three days to get the approval. Uh, probably came out within about a week to inspect it. Um, so uh, I was really glad to see that because I, I, I'd been told it could take a while. And, uh, I was really pleased at how quick it was. Good. We're glad to hear that. All right. Gary? So I'd, um, I would like and request uh, the support from the fellow commissioners. Uh, I'd like to bring back for discussion the ordinance requiring an RM uh, districts when you build single family home, the affordable housing element. Uh, my major concern is that that ordinance, which affects both large and small, is unfairly weighted to the small builder and small units. And uh, what I'd like to see us do is bring it back and have a discussion, put it on the agenda uh, for a recommendation to the city council that maybe we limit that, that a certain number of homes, if you're building 20, that under 20, you're not required to meet that requirement. Um, and I'd like to see if we could bring that. I'd like you to tell us at our next meeting when you can agendaize that, if my fellow commissioners agree, to have that discussion on whether or not we pass a recommendation onto the city council um, uh, to change that particular ordinance or to adjust it. I'm for that. I think you have direction, Mr. Director. Okay, so at your next meeting, I'll, I'll bring back uh, uh, some sense of when we can put this on your agenda. Most likely, it would not be in December, probably even January. Yeah. Just essentially, th that's the part that, and looking at that many times that we've gone over it, the real key is the burden it puts on the small builder and, and all of these in-lot things that we'd like to get done. Uh, we'd like to see them infilled, and I think uh, the state wants to see us get them infilled. Um, that we need to look at that particular thing and maybe look at the number of units that you have to build to do that. Uh, I meant to also ask uh, earlier when they were here, 
I think the state is coming out with a law, uh, deal, this dealing with solar. I think the state is coming out with a law, I'm told, that all new housing is going to have to have solar on it. Um, so uh, somebody told me that that's, that's somewhere in, in a certain year that that has to take effect or it's coming to that zero emissions house or uh, something like that. So while we're looking at all this stuff, it might be good to look forward to see if that is coming down the line uh, for, for, for new housing and, and developments that uh, that's happening because we're making these changes and rules. There's and no active AD bill in place right now being pushed through that has that. Well, I'm, I'm told that it's already been put in place, but it has a year when it kicks in. So I mean, I don't either. So I, I was told that. So I'm, it might be something to for staff to take a, a peek at so we get in front of it rather than trying to run around and fix it after it arrives, if that's the case. We'll, we'll look, we'll look see into if it. That's, right. come, that's the first I've heard of that. Thank you. So. Yep. All right. Anything else? All right. Well, we're adjourned till November 22nd, unless it's canceled. Thank you. <laughs>